you know, if you look at media, for example, uh, you know, the, the internet uh, and the World Wide Web in particular led to this massive democratization of the ability to publish, to reach people. But most of the people who publish on the World Wide Web don't make a living at it. There, there's a huge amount of creativity expressed and there is certainly low barriers to entry, new people coming into the market, uh, and some of them rising up and making new businesses that are very successful, you know, blog networks that turned into the Huffington Post or, you know, in our, in the computer industry, TechCrunch, which later got bought by the Huffington Post. So there are many, many, many new kinds of businesses that arose on the internet, uh, many of which became very large, but that democratization at the bottom was just kind of that early stage of everything bubbling up. And, uh, you know, the same thing on YouTube. You see there's a, a relatively small number of people making really good incomes as YouTube creators, a lot of people uh, making only a little bit of money. There's one uh, version of the story that says that's actually the future. You know, people are going to have multiple streams of income. Uh, part of what Brian was describing in his talk on Airbnb uh, was this notion of people saying, you know, thank you, back in 2008, because of you I was able to keep my house. You know, so it's, it's incremental income that would let them, uh, you know, keep their home. Or, uh, you know, as I said, when I, I talk, when I take an Uber, I talk with the driver. And, you know, uh, often they have a story of, of like, this is, is not my main job, it's just, it's something I can fill in with, I can, I can get a, additional income. I have a very personal story of that, a, a young friend of mine who had an ambition to become a public defender, a wonderful, socially valuable career, but it was very hard for him to get there. He, you know, he didn't actually pass the bar the first couple of times, and so he had this head of halfway house jobs in the system, and a lot of uh, debt from law school, and he was originally playing poker to, to make ends meet, and then, you know, Lyft came along, he was able to, you know, to become a driver. You know, he now has a full-time job as a public defender, but he was able to kind of piece together his career because he had these alternate sources of income that not only were, were good income, but were under his control, as opposed to, you have to have a job at these hours, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for the job to come to me and I don't match. You know, I do think there's an important piece of this where it really is self-directed and self-controlled, but does it in the end add up to the kind of economy that we took for granted for so many years? And uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, I'm, this is unfortunately... Or is it a better economy? It could be uh, better. You know, yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's, this is a major, major topic. Um, I just want to kind of suggest that the 20th century was defined almost totally by looking at financial capital. We're now moving into a world where financial capital and social capital have to be combined. Yeah. And so there's a sense, is my life more meaningful in this new way? Have I constructed a new, a better sense of a more robust sense of identity? Uh, am I engaged more in what's happening? And am I capable of actually having a more sustainable life by, by not needing so much stuff because I can use Uber when I want? Yeah. And so I think we're, we're gonna move into a new set of fixed points. And we don't really quite understand what those types of trade-offs are going to be. And I think it's going to be very, very depending on... Yeah, I think there are a lot of choices. Is a choose your own yeah. adventure here because, uh, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is the 20th century economy of, you know, well-paying middle-class jobs, uh, you know, at companies where you had a job for life, uh, you know, has really broken down. And we now have increasing returns to capital. And we say, well, all these are low-paid service jobs. That's actually a social compact. You know, it's, it's how much do companies want to pay their employees? And at some point, I, I think as Nick Hanauer has pointed out really successfully recently, uh, you, know, it's, you know, ultimately companies depend on having customers. Henry Ford, uh, you know, realized that he had to pay people enough so they could buy his product. And we, we knew that for a long time. And I think we've forgotten it. You know, we heard on, in the marketplace session on this stage last night uh, how, uh, you know, 40% uh, of Walmart employees are on public assistance because they're not paid enough to live. And Walmart is then the primary recipient of food stamp dollars spent on food. You know, that's unsustainable, you know, and it's, it's a breakdown of a social compact. This is a different part of, of the cost of capital. Measure. But I think the point you're making is also super critical, which is, you know, once people say, well, actually, I didn't really need to buy that new thing because I don't have enough money for it anyway. You know, and I get much more satisfaction by uh, making something or spending time with my friends or 
doing this creative thing uh, that I'm exchanging with someone else, that, that economy starts to break down for, for, for the big employers as well because they don't have their customers who are as eager to buy their product. So I think we're, we're looking at a very, very different kind of, uh, of economy and I think it's going to, different people are going to wake up at different points to the fact that the rules are different. I think things will rebalance the way you're yeah. talking about, but you know, when, over the next few decades while this is happening and the planet gets to about 9 billion people. Yeah, that's, uh, that's why we need this. Right, <laughs> occupy Mars. Uh, and you know, my experience in trying to hire people uh, to do research and development type work has led me to believe at least that the population uh, is not uniformly willing to take risks that you know, a relatively small percentage of the population seem to be genetically predisposed to taking risk in what they do. And the rest of the people are uncomfortable with it. And I worry, you know, you said the last session said, oh, you know, we're gonna have 100 million entrepreneurs around the world. Well, that's great, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to the number of jobs that are gonna be required for people to just sustain life. And so it, these points may be true. People will maybe choose to rebalance their lives in terms of what their expectations are. But we're talking about a lot of mouths to feed on a planetary basis, and certainly even in this country. And I think that there's some bigger problems just in terms of the, the makeup of people and, and their comfort with dealing with these things that are going to make it hard to get the whole population, or at least the center, uh, of the yeah. distribution to be comfortable of making yeah. it all up as they go.